and um, and it's interesting. Uh, what, what's interesting is, you know, of course, as an editor, um, we also saw, you know, a swell of uh, exactly those activities where we saw a swell of papers coming through yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and people were more productive writing, uh, you know, writing up their data. And yeah. uh, and then it changed. Um, uh, you know, I think that now we kind of have the first swell is over. People are starting to get back into, mm -hmm. you know, analyzing and collecting mm -hmm. uh, more data. But uh, yeah, it, 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 I think it, it in, in many ways, it probably has taught us uh, 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 that we can be more flexible in doing things um, and getting things done. I mean, I think that the big issues will be, can we have uh, decent metrics of performance? Um, because, uh, you know, I mean, it, 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 you have to, in the end, uh, you have to get things done um, and uh, you have to see who can get them done and who can't. Um, yeah. and, 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 um, but it, it'll be interesting to see how the institutes uh, will work through this kind of di difficult, you know, I mean, I've, I've been on several, as probably you have too, um, mm -hmm. EAC meetings with uh, centers and um, talk to various K and uh, R awardees. And, you know, some people have been very much influenced by it. Some people not so much because they were more able to do uh, data analyses and publish things. Um, but uh, it, 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 I think that we'll see down the line um, uh, that there will be, you know, some challenges coming towards the institute. How do we, how do we moderate that for an individual yeah. investigator? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, it'll be interesting for all of us. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, we could uh, we could uh, go on for a little while longer, but uh, I know the time is. Uh, we have uh, noon, a little afternoon. People are coming in. Yeah. Um, so uh, let me just do a, a brief introduction. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm very excited to, to everybody. I'm very excited to have. Uh, Professor Stephen Hickens uh, give uh, the WKW lecture today. Um, as you can see on the title slide, he's the, uh, the director of the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health. Um, and he's also uh, a, a Virginia H. Donaldson Professor of Translational Science in the Department of Psychiatry and Psychological Science at the University of uh, Vermont. And uh, just going a little bit back in time, um, so Steve got his uh, BA in uh, at, at uh, Shippensburg University in uh, in Pennsylvania, um, and then later on, um, and actually an MA, it moved to uh, the University of Kansas in Lawrence, Kansas, where he got his MA and then his PhD. Um, he did his postdoc at uh, Johns Hopkins, um, and uh, uh, then moved on from Johns Hopkins briefly uh, at NIDA. Uh, but then to Vermont and has been in Vermont for quite some time um, and has really Now, this is important is because, um, particularly in the substance use field, and unfortunately, we are in a situation where substance use disorders are um, making a bit of a comeback. It, um, you know, we've sort of been clouded by COVID for a while and forgot about the opioid epidemic, but now it's, of course, it, it continued. And in fact, it probably gotten a little bit worse. And now we have uh, another substance to deal with, which is the resurgence of methamphetamine. Um, but for both of these disorders, we know that interventions are very tough and um, are fraught with uh, 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 the problem of re uh, relapse and recurrence. Um, and well, what's interesting is that contingency management is actually potentially one of those interventions that could have a, a really changing impact in the field. Um, and uh, there's, I, could, I couldn't think of a better person um, than to present to, to us today than Steve. He's been working on this for many years. He's been um, very productive. Uh, in fact, I just want to, um, even though it's not, uh, can't officially talk about it, but unofficially I will talk about it. He has a, a wonderful meta-analysis and review coming up in Journal Psychiatry um, that uh, will really show the efficacy of uh, contingency management. I'm sure he's uh, presenting some of the data uh, today. But um, Steve, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to have you present to the group. Um, I think that there are enormous opportunities now 
um, for contingency management because when it first was implemented, which is a while back, we didn't have the technology that we now have available. Right. And um, and I do think that this uh, it could be a game changer. So uh, thank you for making the time and thank you for meeting with uh, the trainees and the, and the faculty. And I'm uh, very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mark, for the generous introduction. And to the birds, it's really an honor and a pleasure. So um, you see my title slide, Changing Drug Use and Other Health-Related Behavior in Adults with Contingency Management. So in a way of acknowledgments and disclosures, um, I've had wonderful colleagues and collaborators and uh, pre-docs and post-doc trainees, research staff, generous and continuous NIH research support for greater than 35 years. Uh, without that support, I would not be able to uh, do or couldn't have done the research I'm going to share today. And then I have nothing to declare in the way of conflicts of interest. So um, the opioid epidemic, is, as, as you know, is uh, continues to be a public health uh, crisis in the U.S. And um, the uh, compounding overall risk from opioid use disorder um, it's often accompanied by a cascade of risky behaviors and especially other substance use. And then the increasing levels that, that Martin uh, just alluded to of psychomotor stimulant, cocaine, and methamphetamine among people with opioid use disorder is a grave concern um, with, for example, overdose uh, deaths from cocaine, other psychomotor stimulants, more than doubling between 2011 and, and 17. And, and um, those events have uh, led people to start using the term twin epidemic. So we had the opioid epidemic, and now we have the psychomotor stimulant epidemic. And um, unfortunately, the, the medications that effectively treat opioid use disorder, not effective for uh, psychomotor stimulant use disorder. And we don't have any medication for psychomotor stimulant use disorder. So what that created a situation where guidance on how you should approach uh, psychosocial interventions is typically that they recommend use, a, use a, um, a psychosocial intervention, but they don't give any guidance on which psychosocial in, uh, intervention you should use. So, um, oh, I'm unable to advance my slide here. Um, can someone Let's see what's going on. Um, I think if you move your cursor on your, if you have a two window screen, you can move your cursor back into your um, a presenter window, uh, push the button, and then you should be able to move forward with it. Um, so give me that again. I can see, I can see your mouse. Um, yep. And if you uh, see. Oh, there you we can go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that worked. I just clicked on there. All right. Very good. So, um, this is a um, meta-analysis on the comparative effectiveness, efficacy, and acceptability of psychosocial interventions. So these investigators, if you haven't seen the paper, it's, it's a really good review. It was published in Post Medicine, um, the tail end of, of 2018. And um, they, they are over in Oxford and they are not specialists in substance use disorders per se. They specialize in systematic reviews for psychiatric conditions. And they took on this question. And um, so they, they, in their review, they um, identified 50 randomized controlled uh, trials, almost 7,000 participants with cocaine or uh, amphetamine use disorder. And um, they were comparing, they were looking for trials that compared a structured psychosocial treatment versus another uh, structured treatment or treatment as usual. And the numbers you see listed there, the power was, was very good, both for structured treatments and for uh, treatment as usual. And the 12 structured interventions are, are interventions that are very familiar. Cognitive behavior therapy, contingency management, community reinforcement approach, and then some others that aren't as prominent, but meditation-based therapies, and then a, a list of others. You see them there. And they identified a minimal duration for it to be uh, included at least uh, four more weeks, and then um, four uh, primary outcome measures. They were interested in biochemically verified absence 
at 12 weeks, somehow in the substance use disorder field, that's like become a standard duration of treatment. Um, and then the end of treatment in case it wasn't 12 weeks, long as follow post-treatment follow-up and then retention across those same time points. And they compared all out they compared outcomes of all the structured treatments against treatment as usual and also between the structured treatments. And so you can, this is a forest plot that, that was part of that review. And you can see in the legend here, the uh, colored lines that they are um, using to represent the, the different outcomes. You know, there, there are five, I, I said four by accident. And um, so, and then here um, are the treatments that are being compared. And so this is a forest plot. If the point estimate is on the right side of this line, then it, it uh, favors the, the uh, intervention group rather than the control group. And if the confidence interval doesn't overlap with the zero line, then it's a statistically significant effect. So the treatment at the top is this contingency management plus the community reinforcement approach. And it would produce significant outcomes across each of these outcomes. And it's the only intervention that produced those outcomes. And so now if you look at uh, taking this component, contingency management, and combining it with 12 step, a 12 step program, you lose the efficacy. So it almost undermines the efficacy of the contingency management if, it, if that was an active component up here. And then if you take the community reinforcement and instead of uh, the conventional contingency management, you do what is known as non-contingent rewards, you retain one of the outcomes, but you lose four of them and so on and so forth. The only intervention that could impact all of them was this combination of contingency management and the community reinforcement approach. And um, you see that now over here, it's just continuing the same. The lots of overlap with the, um, with, with the zero line, or actually now you're getting some point estimates are on the left side. So, um, so that was the one intervention that could produce efficacy during the intervention and long-term. This is a uh, NIDA therapist manual on that therapy. And it just happens that I devoted about 20 years of my life developing this treatment. And uh, so I know a good bit about it. And what I'm gonna do is try and take you through the trials, a little trip down memory lane for me. It's kind of fun putting the slides together, but try and introduce you if you're less familiar um, with contingency management to how it's implemented. And it's around this, this challenge um, in these studies of a psychomotor stimulus for which nothing else really works. Um, so back, um, in the 1980s, 1990s, there was a cocaine epidemic in the United States that is much was much like the current opioid epidemic. You know, in the mainstream press, you know, having tremendously um, adverse impacts, uh, people overdosing, and increases in all kinds of um, um, unsavory behaviors, prostitution, and uh, infectious disease. So. Um, at the time, the scientific community was really caught unprepared. And in fact, it's so looking back, you just shake your head. We didn't realize that cocaine was an addictive substance the, that we should have. And there was data that, that in hindsight, um, you would think would, would have alerted people, but we just didn't recognize it. And the whole culture was naive to, to its potential um, ability to produce tremendous levels of, of addiction. But um, when the signals start coming in, then there was a real call to do something. And people start throwing everything, in, uh, including the kitchen sink, at it. And the, the literature was quickly filling up with failures, whether you tried behavioral interventions, pharmacological interventions, um, everything was, was uh, producing miserable outcomes. And then so I had just gotten my job at the University of Vermont. So there were three of us um, assistant professors, myself, a fellow named Warren Bickwell has gone on to have a good career, um, and, and John Hughes similarly um, went on to have an outstanding career. So um, we were sitting around trying to figure out what it, NIDA had proposals. We were trying to get a grant. What, what, what do you think we should try? Um, and so we looked at the pharmacology of cocaine 
And I can still see the meetings. And we thought, you know, cocaine through them largely. Do you think there's going to be a drug that's selective enough to uh, impact um, the dopamine system sufficiently to decrease or eliminate cocaine use, but leave everyday behavior intact? And we thought, I don't think so. And um, our guess was right. We decided we're going to have to go with a behavioral intervention. And now 30 years later, however many, many decades later, that's still the case. So I, I think our um, guess was correct. Um, and now as, as Martin was talking, there's like the, the epidemic really never went away. And um, it, it just calmed down enough and some new uh, problem got people's attention, but it's there been, been uh, sitting there in certain communities and now it's re made a resurgence. And especially in those with opioid use disorder, it's being cut with fentanyl. And so now people who may not have opioid use disorder just go out and, and buy some cocaine and um, hear that cocaine is, is cut with fentanyl and they overdose and die. So it's a real crisis. But the, the thing that's getting a lot of attention is its use among those who are enrolled in buprenorphine or methadone treatment, because the fear is, is that it's going to undermine all the progress we made with getting those pharmacotherapies available for the opioid crisis. So what I want to do is just give you an introduction to the um, CRA plus vouchers treatment. And the, the vouchers is the CM part of it and the CRA community reinforcement approach. So uh, we recommended a, a one-year relationship with the clinic of UL. This was, we were trying to develop an, outp an outpatient intervention. And so during the first 12 weeks, we were going to recommend that someone come in for twice weekly CRA counseling, one individual counseling. Um, and they were focus, focusing on how to derive naturalistic sources of reinforcement from the community for healthy lifestyle choices. And then we were going to do thrice weekly, three times Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, urine toxicology testing, because we wanted to be able to detect any cocaine use that went on. And with that, that um, amount of testing, you, you, you should be able to do that. And then we, we uh, came up with this voucher-based uh, contingency management intervention. And I'm going to go into de more detail about this about the CRA counseling and the voucher-based CM. But our, our rationale was that initially, um, we want to be able to engage these individuals in treatment. And we thought offering an intervention like a voucher-based contingency management could get them, keep them initially engaged in treatment while we could do the more difficult work of um, counseling them around lifestyle changes that will allow them to have a more meaningful life and hopefully have that compete with the allure of cocaine. And then in the second uh, 12 weeks, we would start decreasing the intensity of treatment. So we cut the counseling down to once weekly. We would discontinue the voucher program, but we didn't want to stop any form of contingency management. So if we took a urine and someone gave us a, a negative urine, they would get a $1 uh, lottery ticket. And then uh, after 24 weeks or six months, we went to what we referred to as an aftercare as a very informal kind of uh, loose uh, check-in, but on monthly, if the therapist could reach the person just to see how they were doing. So if there were flare-ups with cocaine again, we could try and assist the person in putting out, uh, out the fire. So now this, this uh, voucher program, the contingency management, what we did is cocaine negative specimens earn these points that were recorded on vouchers. And again, it's kind of fun to picture these three assistant professors kind of making it up as we went. So they, they would, um, but, but informed by what we knew, we were trained as behavioral pharmacologists and there was preclinical and clinical lab studies around this kind of thing that, that gave us ideas. So they're worth a quarter each. And um, so they would get 10 points the first time they were negative, uh, low value of $2.50. But the value escalated with each consecutive no cocaine, uh, cocaine negative test. So, so what we were trying to do there is we're trying to differentially reinforce continuous periods of cocaine abstinence because thinking that's really the target of addiction treatment is to try and 
um, if you, you know, the optimal success would be that they would have a, like, quit using drugs for the rest of their life. And then if they could, in an outpatient, these are all cocaine dependent or cocaine use disorder uh, people, if they could go one week in an outpatient setting without uh, using cocaine, we wanted to make a big deal of it. So we would give them a $10 um, voucher bonus. And um, then a little catch is that if they were cocaine positive or they just blew us off for a scheduled uh, test, then the value of the incentive would get set back to that initial $2.50 value. And what we wanted to do is just give them an immediate material loss. So if they bump into an old friend that, that they use cocaine with or not, just give them something, some reason to stop and not reflexively just in, engage in cocaine use. And then if they did get reset, we wanted to give them an incentive to keep trying. So if they got five consecutive negative tests, um, then they would be returned to where the vouchers were prior to the reset. And overall, they could earn $997.50 across the 12-week uh, voucher program if they were always clean and always, if they always came for their tests and they were always clean when we tested them for cocaine, very specific to cocaine. Now, I want to quickly say that when we first mentioned that value to people in preliminary discussions around a grant, we were laughed at that someone who's you know, losing their families and whatnot over cocaine is going to abstain for $997.50 across a 12 week period. But then when we got the data I'm gonna share with you, it flipped in the other side, like who is ever gonna pay that much to get people not to abstain from cocaine use? So yeah, either way you, you kind of get it. Um, now the, the uh, CRA. So, um, here again, we're thinking about when those in, those that voucher program is discontinued, what is going to sustain the abstinence? And if you think as a behavioral pharmacologist thinks about these things, there's going to be have to be some sort of natural source of reinforcement for that same kind of behavior or lifestyle, the healthier uh, drug-free lifestyle. So we did these five general things. We give them skills training to how you avoid antecedents of cocaine, how to find alternatives to the positive cocaine, positive consequences of cocaine use. And, and there are many, they don't use these drugs for, for no reason. Um, but then also uh, to make explicit the negative consequences that they've experienced. So, you know, they were arrested, they had this bad thing, they had that bad thing, they end up in the ER with having um, cardiac problem. Just make lists, for example, and put them on your refrigerator. So just different um, skills that you, you can develop to help you with these things. And then um, we spent a lot of time and we used the voucher program to support cost around developing new drug-free recreational and social activities. And the concept here, again, in behavioral pharmacology is there have to be alternative non-drug reinforcers that are going to sustain this new uh, behavior set that you're trying to promote. If someone was unemployed um, or had jobs to increase risk of cocaine use, very common uh, bartenders, hairdressers, uh, nothing against those trades, but there's often associated with cocaine use in our experience. Um, we did an evidence-based uh, job, uh, an evidence-based intervention on how you help people who are chronically unemployed get a job. It's known as job club. It's in the literature. Um, then patients with romantic partners who are not drug abusers, we offered reciprocal relationship counseling, and they were trying to strengthen uh, just naturalistic sources of reinforcement. Many of us are familiar with, with all these, you know, a job that you have to, you can't go out and party because you got to go to work tomorrow. You know, you want to be available and enjoy time with your spouse. And then those who had alcohol use disorder, which is the majority of our, our people, or at least they, of the patients we treated, or at least they were using alcohol socially, we offered um, disulfiram therapy. And I'm not gonna have um, anything more to say about it other than this. Disulfiram therapy is a, a medication that interferes with metabolism of alcohol. And if you can um, get adherence with the medication regimen, which we could get as part of the um, regular attendance at the clinic, then you can decrease drinking. And in our hands, we had evidence that decreasing the, the sulfur therapy also decreased cocaine use in that population. 
All right. So um, the first study we did was we the first fully randomized control trial we did is this paper right here, 1993 in American Journal of Psychiatry. And what we were doing is just taking this treatment I just described to you, and we were comparing it to what's already available in our communities and many uh, communities throughout the US at that time. And I think still at this time, what might be called standard drug abuse counseling, based on a disease model, a model, 12 step, that sort of thing. So we hired therapists who were um, trained in, in some form of behavior therapy, and we taught them the CRA vouchers, and we hired others that were expert in, in standard drug abuse counseling. We had expert um, supervisors for both. We took Vermont, very small ends, system professors who were just finding their sea legs. We had 38 cocaine-dependent subjects. We randomized them to these two treatments, the treatment package, the CRA plus vouchers, or this, um, this standard of care. And the six months of treatment, six months of follow-up. These are results. I just This is right out of the uh, publication. And so um, what we're showing here, the percent of subjects who received the behavioral, the CRA vouchers or standard, um, who were cocaine absent during these consecutive 24 weeks of treatment. And so what you are seeing here, they started out very similar. And then these open symbols is what you were seeing in the literature. You know, people either stop coming to therapy or they resume cocaine and they fail miserably. This was an exception. And so we didn't know how much of an exception until we took it to a, 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 our first conference, which was a session on treating cocaine dependence at the College on Problems of Drug Dependence. And this was just stuck, stood out like a sore thumb. And so you would think maybe like, there would be positive excitement that, hey, we have a breakthrough. Well, they got that this was unusual, but there were a lot of criticism. And um, so um, let me just see this. This is not the slide I thought I'd be going to. Um, okay, so anyhow, we, we go on to another trial now. We want to start, you know, it's a treatment package. We want to start parsing the treatment. So one of the questions in that CPDD, there was a criticism that I want to get to, and that is the only reason you can get that outcome is because you got, you're doing it in Vermont and they aren't real addicts. And I'll, I'll show you a study we did on that. But here, we just wanted to say, you know, where, and this was a very a reasonable question, what of the many things you're doing is uh, responsible? So this is a trial now where we, we have 40 cocaine dependent applications and everybody, they're gonna be randomized to two groups. One group is going to get the full package. The other group is just going to get the uh, CRA treatment. They are not going to get the uh, voucher program. And the outcomes were very clear. And this was published, I should say, in um, Archives of General Psychiatry, which is now um, JAMA Psychiatry. And um, so uh, this is uh, the mean uh, dur the duration of the mean duration of continuous cocaine absence. Remember, I said that's what we're trying to differentially reinforce with the voucher program. And so this uh, filled bar or darker bar is the um, group that that got the uh, vouchers plus the CRA, and these guys just got the the CRA. So you were doubling uh, the duration of continuous absence by offering the uh, voucher program. But over here, this is the division, first 12 weeks, remember that's when the voucher program was active, then we discontinue, you have this very nice uh, treatment effect, but you also have it in the second 12 weeks when we had discontinued the voucher program. So that was important signal, but this is what we were reporting during treatment outcome. All right, so now the challenge of, you don't really have addicts in Vermont, um, there was some of it was legitimate. So that's what gets you to do the trials in that uh, we had largely almost exclusively Caucasian population. And at this time, crack cocaine was on the, season, on the scene, but in Vermont, they were still using largely powder cocaine and many of our people uh, were using um, intranasally. 
So now we uh, hooked up. This is, um, I had been, Martin mentioned, at the Addiction Research Center. So I hook up with colleagues back there, one of whom was CR or Bob Schuster, who had just uh, stepped down as the director of NIDA. And he was trained as behavioral pharmacology, and he understood what we were trying to, to get uh, accomplish with this intervention. So what they did was agree to look at this voucher program in a group, uh, methadone maintenance program where uh, people who were receiving methadone for opioid use disorder were using cocaine. And so here's what, here's what the data showed on that. And, and again, look at the, at the slide. I have to go back and find the, the study, but the results were unequivocal. So this is percentage subjects, cocaine abstinent, and this is the, the uh, absence reinforcement group. They're going to get the same voucher program. We just took the voucher program down to, uh, I should have said, the Addiction Research Center is in Baltimore, Maryland. And all these in, individuals in the, in the, in the uh, treatment here were intravenous, chronic intravenous heroin and cocaine users. So they met every definition of addict, including racial diversity, city, urban, and not rural. In those days, all your addiction was supposed to be in urban settings, settings and not in rural Vermont. So um, this is the amount of cocaine absence in a base five-week baseline period. Then you randomly assign, this is 37 people, you randomly assign them to get the voucher program or to get non-contingent rewards of comparable value. And that is if, if it's just given them extra resources, then these groups should be the same. This group had to show us they were cocaine absent to get the voucher. This group would get a voucher of the same value independent of their uh, cocaine use. Overwhelming increases, uh, statistically significant increases in co uh, cocaine absence. Then we discontinue the voucher program and there is definitely some relapse, but they didn't go back here. Um, and they're not statistically significant, but I think that was largely underpowered to look for that. But really, this is what we were trying, we were after. Okay, so now we're feeding across trials. In back in Vermont, what we're trying to do is just get more rigorous with each trial. Um, in terms of what we're zeroing in on in, uh, with regard to the elements of treatment and then how far out we're following people. So this is a study that we published in 2000, Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology. And we're gonna um, look at the uh, CRA plus voucher. Um, everybody is going to get, and I should say there's now we're up to 70 people in our trial, 35 per condition. And in the standard group, they're going to get the uh, vouch CRA plus vouchers program in exactly the way that I just described to you. And in the other group, they're going to get the vouchers and the CRA, but the vouchers are going to be given non-contingently like in the trial we did in Baltimore. So we're kind of feeding back and forth here. And so the only difference um, between these two treatment groups is in the first 12 weeks, that contingency on the availability of the vouchers, the counseling, the duration, the therapist, everything else the same, 12 weeks of just that difference in the contingency around the voucher. And this is, are the outcomes. Again, we're looking at percent of participants and the um, dark bars represent the group that's um, got getting the vouchers contingent on showing us they haven't used cocaine. And then the open bars, they're getting the CRA vouchers, but the vouchers can be earned independent of their urine tox results. And these are different durations of continuous cocaine absence. So whatever duration we looked at, getting them contingent on absence was very important to the amount of absence you got. It reinforced the, the, the act of abstaining from cocaine use. All right. And then this is where we're now expanding out how long we follow the people. So we follow them out to 18 months after um, coming into the um, clinic and um, or 12 months after the end of the 24 week treatment. And every time this is point prevalence absence, which means that you have to tell us you haven't used cocaine in the past 30 days and give us a cocaine negative uh, urine tox result. And every time you look, 
out through 18 months, the group that got the incentives contingent on abstinence are doing better. And uh, so it's, it's kind of a little mind boggling. And this is just looking at con uh, continuous cocaine absence throughout the follow-up period. But just that contingency difference um, in the first 12 weeks is having this impact. All right, so now um, when we would do these trials, we would look at what, what predicts who's going to do well longer term. And when you looked, it was overwhelmingly that duration of continuous absence you got during the treatment period. So, I, you know, when you think of that, you can dismiss it pretty quickly in that, well, of course, people who are going to do well longer term are going to do well shorter term. And that's like a no brainer. But what we wanted to do here is can you experimentally create different amounts of continuous absence and get that same outcome? So we're going to take people, um, and I believe in this trial, it's 100 people, and we're going to randomize them to the CRA plus voucher treatment. And now everybody is going to get contingent vouchers, but one group is going to get the vouchers at a value that's twice our usual amount. And the other group is going to get value vouchers at half our usual amount. So now we're up to everybody essentially gets the same treatment. The only thing we're manipulating is the value of the incentive. Oh yeah, so I, I, I didn't realize I had gone into all this. Uh, so this is just the same, I just, I just told you this. Um, and then we're going to follow them out for two years. So the first thing, can you get the difference during treatment that we're looking to create experimentally? Random assignment, these are the same people conceptually in, in, the, same, in the two groups, not identically. I mean, not really the same people, but the same characteristics. Um, and so we get the significant difference in the duration of continuous absence we're looking for. And then when you look at it, point prevalence absence across a two-year period, every time you look at them, the group that's getting the, the higher voucher amount, but the greater duration of continuous absence during the treatment period is, is doing better. So I don't think it's just a case of like people who do well early do well long uh, later, but that giving them conditions under which they can experience a period of continuous abstinence from this drug that's ruined in their lives has important prognostic implications. Okay, so we have, um, you know, we were very interested and, in, you know, there's a whole, as Martin could share, there's a whole like bunch of stuff that goes along with, you know, scientists are people and there's a lot of competition and, you know, disparaging of different treatment approaches and whatnot. So it is a lot of fun. So we would do review papers every couple of years to just see how this is developing. Um, so the first one, we, we did three over 24 years that are already out. And I was actually, I'm not going to show results from the most recent one because I had the, uh, the associate editor and we're sworn to secrecy. So I, I follow orders very well, Martin, and I'm not going to show it. But I'm going to show you these results, and I, I think they're interesting. So the first one was in, in 2006, and that was a meta-analysis. And in 2011, I did a book chapter, and we, you know, Followed the people further, um, followed the studies. We're looking at um, controlled studies on the voucher intervention or related interventions that are published in peer reviewed journals so we can see how this intervention is developed. And then in the most recent was 2016, and that carried us out from 1991, which is the um, first controlled study, but not fully randomized, where we control, we compared, it was like that first study I, I uh, talked to you about, but um, the first couple people were assigned to the new treatment as pilot participants. We saw they were doing well, then everybody else was randomized. So we used that as the starting place, and then we would continue to follow in each review further out, further out. So um, in that in that uh, Davis et al. out through 2014, um, 24 years, 176 controlled studies reported in peer-reviewed journals. 
151 of them, 86% reported statistically significant treatment effects favoring the voucher-based or some variation, and we could talk about that, but essentially monetary-based contingency management for absence. And now um, I'll give you a little bit more information, but I, I, I just have to share this because I find it's a striking statistic. All right, so now another forest plot, and this is from that first meta-analysis, the uh, Lucier in 2006. So um, we looked at different uh, types of drugs or classes of, of, of drug, and um, the forest plot, remember I said, if it's on the right side, it favors the intervention. So it's the right side is favoring contingency management. If it overlaps with the zero line, then it's not statistically significant. So um, essentially all the drug classes that were looked at, you were getting statistically significant effects. And this only one that overlapped with the zero line was alcohol. It was because at that time there was only a single study and it had variability associated with bigger confidence intervals because only a single estimate. Um, but even uh, I think this year was, uh, there is a um, report in JAMA Psychiatry on an efficacious CM intervention with um, indigenous populations, American Indian and, and Native Alaska Natives. Um, so CM works with all different drugs. And I'll say more about this, this nicotine because um, we would try and learn things about how to man manage cocaine use by doing brief studies, um, like varying that, that uh, escalating schedule and that sort of thing. And we would use uh, tobacco smoking as a stand-in for cocaine use, figuring out, you know, it's drug maintained responding. Um, so anyhow, uh, tremendous efficacy for all different classes of drugs. Whether you used a, a control condition of no voucher or you gave the um, vouchers non-contingently, like mentioned in several studies, it didn't make any difference. So if you're gonna give them non-contingently, you might as well not give them. So providing the resources is not contributing to the outcome. These are, uh, we're looking at effect size here, Cohen's D. Um, duration of treatment was not making a, uh, was not a moderator of the, of effect size. What was a, a moderator of effect size was the amount of the incentive you gave. So treatment effect size increases as the value of the incentive, the voucher um, increase. And then the other one that, and we have replicated that um, in, in, in recent work and, um, and then the other one that um, mattered, the only other one mattered, was whether you gave the reinforcement within 24 hours after documenting absence, or you gave it at a more delayed time. So you get larger effect size if you deliver the reward close to documentation that the people have not used drugs. Um, and then the setting, the quality score, all that stuff, none of, the, none of those other um, moderators influence the effect size. All right, so now um, I show you the long-term cocaine absence with this treatment, but there's kind of a mantra about this kind of work where you know it, evidence isn't sufficient. People will keep leveling the same criticism. So I try to think like, is, is, are there problems where even if it only worked when the incentives were in place, that it would be worthwhile? So there is a problem, I know some of you may be very familiar and others may be less so, but smoking during pregnancy continues to be a huge US public health problem. Um, it's the leading preventable cause of poor pregnancy outcomes in developed countries. And this just gives you some estimates, you know, about 22% of US women of childbearing age are regular smokers and maybe 13% of pregnant women. And these are, especially the pregnant estimate, it's an underestimate because pregnant women don't like to admit that they're smoking. You know, it's not, it's, not, it's it, yeah, it's stigmatized. And then um, it varies tremendously by socioeconomic status with women who have less than high school uh, education or GED levels, you know, more than 40% in some studies. And then uh, women, you know, who have high levels of academic achievement, very low levels. 
And then uh, looking just among the pregnant women who smoke, about a third of them will quit soon as they find out that they're pregnant. And, uh, and that's like remarkable. And, the, and they'll stay quit for throughout the pregnancy and you know maybe three six months postpartum which you know just putting down the drug use because you got pregnancy tests is pretty impressive about a third of them could do it you ask who can do it more educated women so it's very much around health uh, disparities you know and and yeah it's just the way it is um so the others the two-thirds will keep smoking through the through the pregnancy unless you do something so I, I, I want to move quickly through this, but there will, there has been a tremendous amount of research on trying to figure out how to do it. And the first trial was published in 1984. It's a very intensive treatment. They threw everything at them, and they got pretty good results. But almost all the studies thereafter were um, interventions you could do when they were coming in for obstetrical care. You know, brief, pretty low intensity. And you can, if you get the end large enough, you can show efficacy, but um, no impacts on birth outcomes. The treatment effect sizes are very small. And so this has been, there's a series of meta-analyses that go on that have, you know, now more than probably is closing in on something close to hundred trials, you know, tens of thousands of women. And the interventions that are Evidence-based produce about a 6% increase above control. So the effect size, when you're dealing with the, you know, the single biggest preventable cause of poor pregnancy outcomes, that's not, that's not really too impressive. And the exception is these financial incentives. Instead of 6%, you increase the, uh, up to about 24% above the control condition. So still not the majority of women, but a heck of a lot better than, than what they get. And this is a Cochrane forest plot um, of studies. This was the first one I did in 2004. Heil, uh, who had been a, Sarah Heil had done a postdoc with me at the time. She published a trial in 2008. Long and short of it is, if you look down here at the meta, you can uh, increase the odds that a woman would have quit by late pregnancy almost fourfold by offering a variation of that incentive program that I, I told you about with the cocaine. So we just moved to this population. Okay, other populations you can impact. Um, so you, you, if you know about opioid use disorder, you know that um, there's a huge problem during this epidemic with um, neonatal abstinence syndrome. So being uh, opiate, uh, having opiate use disorder and getting pregnant, it can be managed if you have a planned pregnancy and you take precautions and you work with your obstetrician, but largely that's not what's happening is that pregnant, unplanned pregnancies occur at a high rate in this population. And so Sarah Heil looked to see, is there something we could do about that? She has a, this is grant funded work from NIDA. And, uh, so in this pilot project, and um, again, fine, <laughs> good discipline, there's a bigger study that I'm not going to tell you about, but keep your eyes open and, and it, it, it will appear in the near future, parsing out uh, what I'm going to share with you from this um, pilot study that was published in 2016. But in way of background, so about 40%, 45% of pregnancies in the U.S. are unplanned and there are you know, high levels of economic impact. Um, and then when you go look in the opioid dependent population, about 80%. Um, and then, uh, so in this trial, we're looking at 31 women and they, um, it was, it was like, this is how we do these studies. The first pilot study enter some people as consecutive assignments or admissions to the uh, intervention you're pilot testing. And if it looks good, then just start random that random, uh, randomly assign, assigning them um, to the new intervention or treatment as usual. Um, and these are women who are sexually active, all opioid dependent women in, enrolled in uh, treatment for opioid use disorder, medication treatment for opioid use disorder, sexually active, not planning to get pregnant, but also not using a uh, prescription contraceptive. And um, so the women in usual care, 
they received some condoms, a dose of emergency contraception and referral to a, a local provider. In the experimental condition, there's a treatment package, kind of like the CRA plus vouchers. Um, so there's a World Health Organization intervention where you offer the contraceptive um, immediately available, like offer to initiate uh, the contraception, contraceptive um, at the time the woman presents for treatment. So the woman could come into the clinic, we give, uh, you know, talk to them about the study. If they're interested in it, they could get an IUD or whatever um, a prescription contraceptive they were interested in on site right next door to the opioid use disorder clinic. Um, and then where CM comes into this is, this is, I'm just telling you what Sarah Heil tells me. I don't really know that much about this population and contraceptives, but apparently a lot of women end up um, discontinuing contraceptives because of side effects. And so there was a series of follow-up visits where they could earn vouchers simply by taking the time to talk to one of the nurses about any side effects they were having. They, it had nothing to do with uh, using the contraceptive. And um, the, the, yeah, so that, that's it. If they would stop and just chat about any side effects, they could earn the voucher. And so in terms of the impact on contraception, medically uh, prescribed approved contraceptive use, you can see here across months, the group that was, was getting the full package versus the control, huge differences. And now we have experimentally parsed out what's contributed by the World Health Organization component and what's contributed by you know, combining the two and, and it's, the, it, there's an additive effect, they're both helpful. Um, and then we also impact the amount of pregnancy. So this trial wasn't statistically significant, but you got no pregnancies during the trial in the group that was getting the intervention, but in the control group, you had three pregnancies or 20% of them. And that's also replicated now in our big trial. And then to wrap up with another, now I'm gonna go out from people who are involved in substance abuse treatment and talk about a, um, an intervention around um, adherence with treatment where you can be sure that many of the people do have substance use disorders, cigarette smoking, for example. Um, but as people have had a recent cardiac event and there's a 12 week intervention called cardiac rehabilitation. And I'm gonna give you a little bit, in or, of in, a little bit of information on that, that um, can really uh, improve people's outcomes considerably, including the possibility that they, they will have a fatal outcome. But people who are um, um, Medicaid insured, people who, have, uh, who are less affluent, don't use the intervention. It's, a, it's like a simple, you know, there are numbers go with it, but that's largely the case. All right, so it's a structured treatment, 12 weeks, thrice weekly um, attendance at cardiac rehab, where they get supervised exercise and counseling around risk factor control. So the, the, the arrangement you can see is almost identical to that first 12 weeks of the cocaine treatment, right? So we can just impose the same incentive program, essentially. Um, and so what we're comparing here, here is just standard cardiac rehab or cardiac rehab with an incentive program um, for completing your, your uh, sessions since 36 sessions across the 12 week period. Everything else is largely the same as the trials I was showing you on the voucher program and the um, everybody is Medicaid or in, um, public insured uh, patient. And so this graph just shows the percentage of participants, the blue line or the incentivized participants, these are the usual care, who completed the recommended 36 weeks. And you can double completion of cardiac rehab by offering these financial incentives. And so that 12 week incentive in long, when they, that 12 week intervention, when they followed out, decreases the chances of rehospitalization and dying um, in the first three years. All right, so just to wrap up, I think there's overwhelming empirical evidence supporting the efficacy of CM for increasing absence from psychomotor stimulants and a wide range of other drugs. Um, 
it uh, also extends what I was just trying to show you with the um, contraception, but we're still with opiate dependent women there, but now with cardiac rehab, it extends to other, other types of substance abuse, other types of problems among the substance abusing population and other um, uh, medical conditions. Um, one thing that's important is you, if you're gonna use CM, have a plan for how behavior change will be sustained after CM discontinuation. And I think that's one of the, the biggest gaps and maybe one of the biggest failures of a lot of people that were in all those studies I, I told you about. Once the, their only interest a lot of times was showing that they could get control of the drug use during the treatment period. Um, and in terms of where I'd like to see all this go, I think increasing accessibility to CM as now it was recommended in the first of the Biden-Harris um, that uh, newly released seven year, uh, seven year one drug policy priorities. Um, and right now we could talk a little bit more about it in the QA, but there's a big holdup in that the inspector general in the uh, CMS office, that's the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, don't want Medicaid funds used for contingency management. So it's, it's, a, it's a problem. Um, but but uh, Biden, so all the way at the level of the, of the <laughs> Oval Office, people are pushing back against that because of the kind of evidence that I share with you today. And so I think following those recommendations I'm making here is, is a good thing and it, it's well supported by the scientific evidence. So thanks for listening and happy um, to field any questions. Uh, thank you, Simon. That was fantastic. Uh, really uh, uh, thorough, and 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 the scope was uh, quite impressive. And um, if people have questions, um, I'm going to, I'm going to start with a question. But if people have questions, if they can raise their hand, then I can call them out, or they can type it into the chat box if they uh, would prefer uh, to do that. Um, is or either would be fine. Um, so, uh, Steve, let me ask you a question because you, and, and in some ways, that uh, the the bullet before the last uh, kind of almost raised the issue. Um, you know, we, as you had uh, said, uh, evidence for contingency management to which you have contributed from the beginning um, has been uh, really quite con uh, uh, consistent, um, yeah. and yet the uptake um, has been uh, reluctant uh, in, beyond the research environment uh, yeah. to say at best. Um, what do you see as um, um, ways of um, uh, making it easier? Because let me just uh, give you an example. So even uh, within the health system, um, if you were to provide it, you have to have somewhere the means of providing the means or providing the... the, right. the, the... Yeah. So what, what are your ideas around that to make that so that uh, so that it can actually be delivered in so people don't have to kind of reinvent it uh, one by one. No, great question, and and actually, um, in, in some of my other presentations, I have a bullet on that. But what we need is a transparent um, system so that the bookkeeping is very easily audited and everything is done as is. is um, yeah, just that. And then we need to take the burden off of community clinics for how you implement an intervention like that, uh, like this. And because, um, you know, I think depending on your, the type of training you have, it can be a no brainer how you would do this or completely a head scratcher. And I think in a lot of community clinics um, for substance use disorder, or even in medical, you know, clinics. Some people are trained, especially in medical clinics, to do these kinds of psychological interventions. So I think having services, and they've evolved, um, uh, where um, they will do the intervention for you, essentially. And, and I think that would help a lot. There's some philosophical pushback, but a lot of that has dissipated over time. And especially in periods of crisis like we're in now, where um, you know, people are overdosing at high rates. And so um, clinicians are, you know, familiar, some of their patients. I, I don't think there's as much of philosophical pushback, but I think knowing how to, um, whether you could be reimbursed, the funding for it, the expertise, I think. And the, and the careful bookkeeping with the, um, 
you know, a, um, a method that would be stand up against audit. And I think those are very manageable uh, challenges, but those are current challenges. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Robin. Unmute. Um, so I was curious, so I, my, my Zoom messed up at the beginning of the talk and I, um, I wasn't sure the vouchers, what were they able to use the vouchers for? Because it wasn't just cash. What was the? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I should have said more about that. So um, we, we they could use them for retail items in the community with, you know, some constraints, like they can't buy firearms, they can't buy alcohol um, or cigarettes. On, but more than that, we tried to use them to support the lifestyle changes that we were promoting with the CRA. And so the therapist, the CRA therapist, had those incentives of assuming the person is abstaining from cocaine use, they would counsel the, the patient around, you know, how they might use those incentives. And some common things were, um, you know, how about taking your family out for, I don't know, it could be to McDonald's, it could be something just but to build the family cohesion. Um, how about a gym membership? How about um, some fishing equipment? Those kinds of things were just common, but you're trying to teach them, you're trying to help them use the incentives to build a social network that's healthy and, and does have substance use involved. And then these recreational activities that can um, compete with what they used to do on a Friday evening or a Saturday afternoon and that sort of thing. And that's a very real thing for these patients. <laughs> yeah. A lot of them, uh, you know, you, I was saying to someone earlier today, you think of it as rehabilitation. For a lot of times, it's habilitation. They were introduced to substances early in school and they only know how to party. And like the idea, a great story is uh, Alan Budney was postdoc. He's now gone on to be a very prominent, he is my first postdoc with this. So we we're trying to encourage the person like, you know, we go out and for hiking. And, and this is a guy who uh, grew up in New York City and was living in, in uh, Vermont. And he couldn't get over the idea. It's supposed to be fun to go out and look at trees. So he says, I'm going to ask Dr. Budney. Dr. Budney does it. I'll try it. Hey, Dr. Budney. Do you go look at trees? <laughs> but that's like, you know, it's just the ideas that, that, you know, of course you help them. We would, the CRA therapist would go for a hike with them and just introduce them to these unfamiliar sources of positive reinforcement. But it's very much thought through a behavioral pharmacology lens of trying to help them come into contact with source, naturalistic sources of reinforcement that can sustain absence after the contrived incentive program is discontinued. I think that I think that's that's wonderful. I do see like in terms of, you know, thinking about Martin's question in terms of implementation, it does seem like, like that that piece of giving them the reinforcement, but in a way that they can't just go spend it on anything and everything and that it's counseled through and that it's well thought out in terms of where that money is then going is I think is a crucial part, but potentially also a, a piece that's harder to think through in terms of, you know, it's not just putting money on their card, you know, or something that they can take forever. It can be the, the, the effect size would probably, in fact, you're giving up a little bit on effect size when you do it the way we do it. We were, we were concerned. First of all, we were, you know, kind of pioneering this approach. And so last thing we needed was it shows up in a paper that we gave somebody a hundred dollars and they, you know, <laughs> bought cocaine and overdosed or something. Right. But, yeah. um, so we were concerned about that, but we, you know, we, we really want to do the kinds of things that, that I'm mentioning, but um, the scientific evidence suggests that if you just put cash on a, on a debit card, it would work as well. And okay. you give up a little bit because you constrain what they can exchange the the you know the money like cash can be exchanged for almost anything where when you're talking about the things i'm doing now you're constraining that you so economically you're going to give up a little bit there and clinics going to have to make up their own minds how they want to do it um, but in terms of getting control over um drug use during the treatment period they're they're um both effective that's useful. And then my other question would be, because I'm used to thinking about, you know, you do therapy, then someone, um, you know, 
has a relapse or whether it's depression or anxiety or substance use or whatever, you do booster sessions, right? Like of, of treatment or something. And I can just see like contingency management. If it was like, oh, if I fall off and I relapse, I can go back in and get a booster and get more money of contingency management. Then you're like reinforcing having a relapse so that you can come back in for boosters. Like have, is there a way or has there been any studies thinking about how like you could do another dose or what yeah. you do if someone doesn't respond and might need more, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I think there's gonna have to be like a time period limit on it. So if you, you, know, you don't, it's chronic relapsing disorder. And so we aren't curing people. I love showing these data and we get great effects, but I do not claim that we're curing people. <laughs> and um, so I would think you'd wanna set up um, you know, that you could come back once, say, in, within a one year period, but then you, you know, not more than that, but should the problems persist beyond that one year period, then you can get so some some um, kind of plan along those lines that I think would be fine or else, you, you, you know, the, the populations we're dealing with are, you know, the, the disadvantage and there will be people who try and game the system. Or maybe you're allowed to come back once per year, you know, or like something so it's like you could get treatment, you know, every, anyway, yeah. yeah that's exactly yeah. what I'm saying, but maybe yeah. not as clear as I wanted to, but yeah, that, okay. you, that you would get the primary treatment and then in X period of time, you could come back one more time because you've relapsed, but then no more than that during that period of time, but should the problems persist or should the, the relapse happen down, further down the road, then you don't worry about gaming and you could get the treatment again. But I, I'm, yeah, I'm really of the mind that um, I wouldn't do, I'll just stop, I'll, I'll just leave it there. I, I think, I hope that answers your question, yeah. Other, other comments, questions? I think um, the, the situation we have right now with um, this being so underutilized is it, a, a real problem. You know, the, the evidence is real. So the thought that we have people in, in medication for opioid use disorder clinics throughout the United States struggling for with, with psychomotor stimulant use. And we say to them, just carte blanche, no, you can't, you can't get this treatment. That the, all the evidence is overwhelming, it, it's effective. Uh, there's a problem, but I, I, I'm optimistic. This is, uh, remember 1991, so you can do the arithmetic. But I, I, I don't remind, I, I'm not um, pessimistic about the chances. I, I think we're in a climate right now where the chances look very good. And the, uh, I think the paper that Martin mentioned that we have coming out, it was a fourth review in that series where we focus exclusively on people with opioid use disorder. And the evidence is overwhelming that it can, it's effective not only for psychomotor stimulants, but other common problems in that population. So with Biden, Harris priorities coming out, review papers like that, other sources of pressure, I think we may get um, some change. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping. Um, yeah. I have a question. Please. Dr. Higgins, do you have any examples or ideas about the longer term supply, sustained abstinence planning of how other people might have tried that or methods they used once the incentive is gone? Yeah, well, in that De Crescenza trial, you you know there are, you could find in that review you will find studies where people did CM with cognitive behavior therapy or other kinds of interventions. Um, so, so I'd encourage you to look there. Um, but and there's a whole lot that went on behind the scenes with this, where NIDA. Um, for back when Alan Leshner was the director, really tried to get people in community clinics to use this CRA plus vouchers um, intervention. And they weren't ready for it. And they were, you know, well, no, no, we, we don't want to use this. You got to give us something else. Some it was nothing else. Um, and, and NIDA 
at some point kind of got reacted to it, I guess I would say, and just stopped supporting um, CM research, at least much of it, not exclusively. They supported Sarah's studies. They supported all the cocaine studies that I did, that I share with you. But they, they, they um, got a little disenchanted, I think, at the community reaction to it. Um, and so we didn't do some of the parametric studies that would answer questions like yours, which is a good one. Um, there are things that Warren Bickle is looking at um, some, uh, what's it called, the um, episodic future thinking as a way um, to try and change people's temporal horizons and um, whether you can combine that with contingency management. We're very interested with the pregnant women because um, of my focus on um, almost like in a little bit of a reaction to all the criticism about you can't sustain uh, abstinence after the incentives are discontinued, even though we show them that we could. And I started looking for where, where would it be good, even if it only worked while they were in place. We didn't spend enough attention, in my opinion, on long-term outcomes with the pregnant cigarette smokers. And so episodic future thinking is one of the interventions we're thinking about pairing with CM in that population. Um, and so the, um, the key, there really isn't much <laughs> besides the CRA that um, has been shown to be efficacious. The other, the other approach is you keep the incentives in place. And you know the yeah. irony is, is that we want to offer this in, in um, clinics, maintenance clinics. So opioid, buprenorphine, maintenance, methadone, as though that group is going to be dependent on opioids. And we learn you have to do a maintenance therapy. You can't give them the medication and discontinue or else to go back. But they're going to have a psychomotor stimulant disorder, and we're going to give it to them for 12 weeks, and that'll be fine. And well, that doesn't make any sense to me. So one of the things that Ken Silverman has shown is you can sustain a psychomotor stimulant absence for years with an incentive program. He's done it, oh, he, he's reported three years, but he's done it for more than that, like six years, I think. Um, and what he, what he developed is what they call a therapeutic work, what he calls therapeutic workplace, where um, they, they earn entry into a workplace, a vocational training program by showing that they haven't used cocaine, but then they can earn vouchers um, in, the, in the program for doing vocational training or actually um, jobs. And for a while, Ken had a business going where he would do, um, oh, like, I can't remember really the task, but he would contract with companies to do tasks for them and he would hire his graduates to do the task and then they would they would have a paycheck coming in, but the, the contingent, in order to stay enrolled, they had to abstain, continue abstaining from cocaine use. So I think maintenance pro programs are an option in this population and it would be funding programs. Um, that would be the challenge. But, you know, again, it's the irony is, well, how do we fund the maintenance program? How do we fund the medication maintenance program? <laughs> well, with, with Medicaid funds, but somehow because it's behavioral, we're like, wait, we don't do that for behavioral treatments. I, I don't know, another, another obstacle, obstacle to be surmounted. But logically, I mean, I think in yeah. certain populations, they need maintenance interventions. Well, I keep getting thrown off of Zoom, uh, which uh, I want to take this opportunity again to uh, thank you, Steve, for doing this. And um, uh, really uh, quite compelling. And I, 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 I'm very excited about the potential future possibilities here. Um, clearly, um, you know, I mean, my interest has always been on the stimulant side. And you know, given yeah. the rates of increasing uh, methamphetamine use, I'm very concerned that, uh, um, that we need to be ready to implement something like this uh, at, a, at a larger scale. Um, and thank everybody for staying on. Uh, we ran a little bit over, uh, mm -hmm. but I think it was well worth it. And uh, again, thank you, Steve, for, uh, uh, for answering the questions and also giving us this really, really impressive overview of your work over the last three decades, which is uh, amazing.
Yeah, thank you, Martin. And thanks for your interest. And it was a great audience. I really appreciate the, the opportunity to share this work with you. So thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.